lesson is on solving trig equations with multiple angles. Before you do this lesson, you should be sure that you have already completed the lesson in solving trigonometric equations. In that lesson, your equation should have been of the form where the argument of the trig function was just a single variable by itself. In this lesson, you're going to find that the argument is a little bit more complicated than that. One of the most important things that you need to do in solving trig equations with multiple angles is to be sure that you find all of the possible solutions. Most of the mistakes that students make are in stopping too soon and not finding all of the solutions. The other things that I'll be watching for as I solve these examples for you is to also notice whether we want our solution to be in degrees or in radians and making sure that our calculator is set accordingly. And also, as we get down to the simplified form of the equation, we'll be wanting to ask ourselves whether we should give an exact value solution or whether a calculator solution would be more appropriate. Remember, if you see those values that represent trig functions of our special angles, then you always want to give exact value solutions in those cases. Let's take a look at our first example. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 2 pi when appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest hundredth. Now, the first thing that I noticed here is that we want x to be in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Now, this interval setup is suggesting to us then that we want radian solutions. Notice that the interval is given in terms of radians rather than degrees, so we want radians. Also notice that x is in this interval. So when we solve for x by itself, the x values need to be between 0 and 2 pi. Now, as we look at our equation, we will proceed sort of like we did with the first lesson on solving trig equations, and that is we will try to isolate the trig function itself first. So notice since we have 2 times the sine function, our first step here will be to divide both sides by 2 in order to eliminate that coefficient. Then we have simplified our equation to sine 3x equals negative 1 half. Now at this point, I don't want you to concern yourself with this argument 3x. Don't be concerned about how complicated that may look. Consider instead the fact that we have a sine function and the value of the sine is negative 1 half. So we'll concentrate there. Since the sine value is negative, that tells us we are in which quadrants? Well, the sine function is negative in quadrants 3 and 4, isn't it? So we know our solution should be in quadrants 3 and 4. Also, since we have this numerical value of 1 half, we know that one of our special angles has a sine value of 1 half, doesn't it? So we're going to think about a reference angle here. Well, the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, but since we're working in radians, we want to think of, instead of 30 degrees, we want to think of pi over 6. So our reference angle is pi over 6. However, we want to concentrate in quadrants 3 and 4. Now, as we find the values, we'll be finding the values of not x, but this whole argument here, 3x, the sine of what is negative 1 half. So this 3x is what we're going to be locating here, okay? Now, how I like to proceed first is to use my reference and the appropriate quadrants to get what I call my first basic solutions. So thinking about the quadrants here, if we use a reference of pi over 6 in quadrant 3, then we have gone pi plus pi over 6. That would give us 7 pi over 6. And if we go to the fourth quadrant with a reference here of pi over 6 going around this direction, since 2 pi is 12 pi over 6, we know that if we lack pi over 6 making a complete revolution, we have gone 11 pi over 6. Now this is where most students then would stop if they're not very careful. But notice we have not yet solved for x. And we're finding values of 3x here, not x. So let's go back to this restriction. This tells us x is in this interval. 
So x must be between 0 and 2 pi. At this point, we are not finding x, but we are finding 3 times x. So notice with this inequality, if we multiply each part of our inequality by 3, we will get a 3x here. 3 times 0 is 0, and then of course 3 times x, and 3 times 2 pi is 6 pi. So in order to find the solutions for 3x, we need to not stay between 0 and 2 pi, but rather 3x needs to run from 0 to 6 pi. Now, we know that if we make a complete revolution, that's 2 pi. If we do a second revolution, we will have come around to 4 pi. And then a third revolution would be 6 pi. So 6 pi is like making three revolutions around our coordinate system here, and so we will need to consider that. Now the easiest way for me to do that is I have my first revolution solutions here. So what I'll need to do is make a complete revolution and come back to this third quadrant. Well, all that involves is adding one revolution, or 12 pi over 6, to this angle here. So adding 12 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6 gives us 19 pi over 6. And then for this basic solution, we will need to do a complete revolution and come back to here. So that will be adding my revolution of 12 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6. So let's see if we add that. We've got, what, 23 pi over 6. Okay. And then we're still not through. Notice this said three revolutions. We've made two. Okay. For our next one, we're just going to do another revolution. We've done one revolution back to here. So now I need to do another revolution back to here to go that third time around. So if I add 12 pi over 6 to 19 pi over 6, I'll be making that third revolution. So let's see, 19 pi and 12 pi is 31 pi over 6. And then adding a revolution to this one, my fourth quadrant answer here, 12 and 23 gives us 35 pi over 6. Notice I had two basic solutions on my first revolution, and then two for my second revolution, and two for my third revolution. So my 3x will have these values. Now we're ready to solve for x. Now we know if we have an equation that says 3 times x, we can divide by 3 to solve for x. Since these are in fraction form, you might prefer to think instead of dividing by 3, to think about multiplying by 1 third. 1 third times 3x will give you 1x, won't it? So, of course, we will multiply both sides of our equation by this 1 third. And because of multiplying fractions, all that's going to do is change these denominators to 3 times 6 or 18. So we will have 7 pi over 18, 11 pi over 18, 19 pi over 18, 23 pi over 18, 31 pi over 18, and 35 pi over 18. Now I want to point something out here that I always like to sort of double check. Notice this largest final solution that we have here. If you were to divide 18 into 35 pi, well, we know 18 times 2 is 36, isn't it? So 18 will divide into 35 just less than 2. So are our x values between 0 and 2 pi? Yes, they are, because 18 into 35 pi will be just a little bit less than 2 pi. Notice that if I had stopped and not gotten these last four solutions and had stopped here when I was finding 3x, I would have missed these four solutions to my equation. So that's the important thing that you want to watch for. Be sure that you take note of your argument because that's going to give you an indication of how many times you're going to have to consider going around your basic circle. And then also consider whether you want degrees or radians and watch for these special values. We could give exact solutions here because of that one-half numerical value. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 2 pi, so again we're working with radians. When appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest hundred. Now we will not know at this point whether we need a calculator yet or not, but we're going to start like we did before and solve for the trig function. So first we will divide both sides by 4. 
Now to save space, I'm not going to show that division. We'll just do that part mentally. But I have divided both sides by 4 at this point, and I have cosine squared 2x equals 1 fourth. Now, notice this says cosine squared, sort of like x squared, something like that. In order to get rid of that square, we need to take the square root of both sides. So taking the square root of cosine squared 2x, we get cosine 2x. And remember, there are two square roots of a number, a positive square root and also a negative square root. So we need to consider both of those square roots. So I'm going to put a plus or minus here. The square root of 1 fourth, of course, is 1 half. So we are at the point where we have cosine 2x is plus or minus 1 half. Now again, let's take note of which function. This is the cosine function. Since the cosine can be either positive or negative, we know that we are in all quadrants. We're not restricted. We're in all of them. Again, though, we have a numerical value of 1 half, so this would indicate one of our special angles. The cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half, but we're working in radians, so instead of thinking 60 degrees, we want to think our reference is pi over 3. So let's get our basic solutions, and notice we're finding basic solutions not for x, but for this whole argument here of 2x. So I'm going to write 2x equals, and if we're doing all quadrants, pi over 3 will be our first quadrant solution. Now, if it's been a while, let's sort of draw this in. So if I use a pi over 3 here, of course pi is 3 pi over 3, so that going from here to here will be 2 pi over 3. And then going to the third quadrant with pi over 3, pi plus pi over 3 is 4 pi over 3. And finally, in the fourth quadrant, since 2 pi is 6 pi over 3, we will lack a pi over 3 getting to 6 pi, which makes us a 5 pi over 3. So I have four basic solutions, one for each quadrant. Now let's consider what we're finding here. We're finding 2x. x is between 0 and 2 pi. So if x oops, is between 0 and 2 pi, then if we multiply by 2, 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times x, 2 times 2 pi is 4 pi. So our 2x values want to keep going until we get to 4 pi. That means we need to make a second revolution here. So again, we want to make a revolution and end up back in our first quadrant where pi over 3 is. So we'll be adding this revolution of 6 pi over 3 to pi over 3. That will give us 7 pi over 3. We'll add a revolution to our second quadrant solution. That gives us 8 pi over 3. Adding a revolution to our third quadrant, 6 and 4 gives us 10 pi over 3. And then finally, if we add a revolution to our fourth quadrant, 6 and 5 is 11 pi over 3. Okay? Now, we have found all of the values between 0 and 4 pi for 2x. Now we need to divide by 2, or if you prefer, think about multiplying by 1 half to solve for x. So 1 half times pi over 3 is pi over 6. 1 half times 2 pi over 3, let's go ahead and cancel those 2's and reduce this. We'll get pi over 3. 1 half times 4 pi over 3, the 2 will cancel with the 4 and leave a 2, so we'll have 2 pi over 3. 1 half times 5 pi over 3 is going to be 5 pi over 6. 1 half times 7 pi over 3 will be 7 pi over 6. When we do the 1 half times 8 pi, we can divide by the 2 and get 4 pi over 3. 1 half times 10 pi over 3 is 5 pi over 3. And finally, 1 half times 11 pi over 3 is going to be 11 pi over 6. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 2 pi. When appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest hundred. You'll notice in this example, we already have this solve for the tangent function. So there's not any preliminary work that needs to be done. 
Notice that the tangent value is positive. So let's think about quadrants. The tangent is positive in quadrant 1 and quadrant 3. So we know our basic solutions will be in quadrant 1 and then over here in quadrant 3. This number, of course, is not one of our special values, is it? So we will not have a special value solution or an exact value solution. That means we're going to need to go to our calculator to get our solutions. Now, first of all, let's be real careful. We're getting radian answers. So be sure before you start pushing keys on your calculator that you have your calculator set for radian mode. Now recall, if you're looking for the argument of the trig function, I'll write this down for emphasis. What you're going to be doing to get this 4x is you're going to be using your inverse tangent function on your calculator. So we've got it set for radians. We're going to do the inverse tangent of 1.245. Okay. Now, notice that this asks us to get the nearest hundredth. However, recall also we're finding 4x. So what I'm going to recommend is that we keep an extra decimal place or two right now because we know we're going to be dividing by 4 to solve for x in a little while, and that will give us a little bit more accuracy and round off. So let me put down for 4x. My calculator solution here is 0.89. I'll round off, keep four decimal places. So 0.8941, okay? Now, we also have a basic solution over here in the third quadrant. Now, this first quadrant value here is going to be the reference angle right here. So we need to take pi and add this 0.8941. Now, since we're working in this decimal form of radians, we're going to need the decimal equivalent of pi. I'm just going to write uh, down here, if I round this off, 3.1416 will be a four decimal place equivalent for pi. So 3.1416 added to the 0.8941 gives me my third quadrant value here of 4.0357. 4.0357. There's my two basic solutions in quadrant 1 and 3. Now, let's look at our argument. It's 4x. Recall again, x must be between 0 and 2 pi. So, I'm sorry, I keep writing that 0. I think I'm writing 0 as I say it instead of thinking x. x is between 0 and 2 pi. Now, to get 4x, we're going to multiply by 4. 4 times 0 is still 0. 4 times x. 4 times 2 pi is 8 pi. That means we need to make 4 revolutions. Okay, this is the first one. So we need 3 more revolutions here, don't we? Now, one complete revolution is 2 pi. And since we're working in this decimal form, what we're going to do here is to take uh, 2 times the decimal form of pi. And I'm going to write that down for us up here, 6.2832. That's an 8. So if we add a revolution to this first quadrant value that we have, we're adding 6.2832. 832 to our point 8941 that gives me a 7.1773 okay now we also need to add a revolution to this third quadrant value that we got so we need 4.0357 we want to add our revolution of 6.2832 that gives me 10.3189. Now this one's going to get long. This is my first revolution, and here's my two solutions for my second revolution. We have to make how many? Four revolutions. Now I'm going to make a suggestion here just in terms of saving us a little bit of time with the calculator. We have not found all of our solutions yet for 4x, but we know eventually down here we're going to want to solve for x and we're going to do that by dividing by 4. So I'm going to make a suggestion that as we get each of these values, we go ahead and divide by 4 as we're having them in our display of our calculator so that we don't have to re-enter all of these. Now I still have 
this 10.3189 in my calculator. So I'm going to divide by 4 right quick while it's still there. I'm going to scoot over here and write this down. 2 point, and at this point I'm going to round off to the nearest hundred. 2.58. Okay, now I'm going to back up and do these others right quick while we're here. 0 0.8941, if we divide by 4, is going to give me 0.22 to the nearest hundred. The 4.0357 divided by 4 is going to give me a 1.01 .01 to the nearest hundredth, and the 7.1773 divided by 4 is going to give me a 1.79, okay? So um, at this point we have two of our revolutions completed. Now remember that this was the second time around, so if I want to go around a third time I just add a revolution to this answer. So let's put that 7.1773, and let's add a revolution of 6.2832 to that. That gives me here 13.4605. I'm going to go ahead while that's in my calculator and divide by 4. And rounding off, I have 3.37 here. Now I need to add a revolution to this 10.1773. 3189, 10.3189, plus 6.2832, let's see, I think I'll come down here, that gives me 16.6021, we will divide by 4, and so down here I have a 4.15 to the nearest hundred. These are my third revolution, so I need to do one more time. Now let's take the solutions here and make another revolution around. So 13.4605, we're going to add a revolution of 6.2832. That gives me 19.7437. We'll divide by 4 to get the x value, 4.94 down here. And then I've just got one more to do. We'll take this third Revolution answer, 16.6021. We'll add our revolution of 6.2832. That is 22.8853, and we will divide by 4. So down here I have a 5.72, okay? Wow, lots of answers. This gets long particularly when your argument is multiplied by a 4 or something like that. Now, what I want to do right quick is just show you on these final answers we have for x. Notice that 5.72 is less than 6.2832, which is 2 pi. So our answers do fall between 0 and 2 pi, don't they? Okay. Now, I might say at this point that I am not doing a check of these answers here because the tape is going to be long enough as it is. But if you're unsure of your answers, you might want to take a few of these and actually put them back in the equation to see if they're checking. Now, I'll warn you that particularly with these calculator values, when you've had to round off, your answer may vary just slightly, uh, but it should be within the ballpark of making that equation a true statement. Okay, well, let's look at another example. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 360 degrees. When appropriate, give a calculator answer to the nearest tenth of a degree. Okay, so now we're going to sort of change gears in that we're thinking degrees. Okay, now let's solve for this trig function. We're going to divide both sides by negative 2. Okay, that'll cancel out. So we have cosine 2x is negative square root 3 over 2. Now, as we've done in the previous examples, let's think, first of all, this is a cosine function which has a negative value. So which quadrant will our basic solutions be in? Well, the cosine is negative where? In quadrants 2 and 3. So those will be our quadrants. Is square root 3 over 2 one of our special value angles? Yes, it is. The cosine is square root 3 over 2 for what angle? 
it's 30 degrees, isn't it? Now remember, again, we're working in degrees this time, so our reference angle is 30 degrees. So let's think about going to quadrant 2. If our reference here is 30, then our angle from here to here would be, what, 150, wouldn't it? So our 2x might be 150 degrees, okay? And then if we go to the third quadrant with our 30 degree reference, 180 plus 30 is 210, isn't it? So our second basic solution is 210 degrees. Now let's consider we're finding 2x. x must be between 0 and 360 degrees. We're finding 2x. So multiplying all these parts by 2, we are going to be going from 0 to 720 degrees. So we need a couple more solutions here. We've only done one revolution. We need to do two. So if we add 360 degrees to 150, you might want to do that on your calculator. If you can't do that in your head, that's 510 degrees. And then we want to add 360 degrees to 210. That's going to be 570 degrees. Okay, so we've done our second revolution. Now we, of course, need to do what? Divide by 2 to find our x values. So 150 divided by 2 is 75 degrees. 210 divided by 2 is 105 degrees. 510 divided by 2 is, what, let's see, 255. And 570 divided by 2 is 285 degrees. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 360 degrees. When appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest, nearest tenth of a degree. Now, we have 2 times the square root of 3 multiplied times this sine function. So we're going to divide by that 2 times the square root of 3 on both sides. And we will have the sine of x over 2 is 3 divided by 2 times the square root of 3. Now, this may not look like a special value, but it's sort of in disguise. Notice if we rationalize this, I have 3 times the square root of 3 on top, and I have 2 times 3, or 6, down here, and then 3 will cancel with the 6. So we will be able to simplify this to the sine of x over 2 is equal to the square root of 3 over 2. Okay? So we're a sine function. It has a positive value. Which quadrants are you in? The sine is positive in quadrants 1 and 2, isn't it? Okay. And square root 3 over 2, which angle has a sine of square root 3 over 2? What's our reference angle? It's 60 degrees, isn't it, since we're working in degrees. So in our quadrant 1, our x over 2 is going to be 60 degrees. And then if we go to quadrant 2 with 60 degrees, our angle will be 120 degrees, okay? Now, let's think about this argument. Here we're told x is between 0 degrees and 360 degrees. Now, this one's going to be a little different. Notice instead of 2x or 3x or 4x, I have x divided by 2. So we're going to divide all parts of our inequality by 2 this time. So I will have 0 is less than or equal x over 2 is less than 180 degrees. Notice this is telling us that x over 2 should stay just in quadrants 1 and 2, which we do have those values. So now, to solve for x, I need to do what here? I need to multiply by 2, don't I, to cancel that out? So we're going to be multiplying both sides by 2 to solve for x. 2 times 60 is 120 degrees. And 2 times 120 degrees is 240 degrees. Now, that was sort of nice, wasn't it? Particularly after doing that tangent thing of 4x. That x over 2, instead of expanding the number of times that we have to make revolutions, it actually decreased that for us. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 360 degrees. When appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest tenth of a degree. 
Now, we're working in degrees, but our equation has become much more complicated, hasn't it? I want to point out a couple of things in this equation to notice. Notice on this side the argument of your cosine function is 2x, whereas over here the arguments of your trig functions are just 1x. So when you have those mixed arguments, a lot of times what you want to consider doing first is to think about is there an identity that I perhaps could use so that all of the arguments of the trig function would be the same. In other words, can I use an identity to change this 2x to 1x somehow? Or is there some way that I can change this 1x into 2x? Well, there possibly is more than one way to do this, and you might spot another way. But what, here's what I'm thinking about. This sine x cosine x really rings a bell for me. Do you remember the identity? Sine 2x is what? 2 sine x cosine x. It seems that identity is used quite often, and so I tend to remember that one. So as I look at this side, I'm thinking I almost have this. So I'm going to do just a little bit of rewriting here. 3 times the cosine of 2x, and I'm going to rewrite that 8 as 4 times, and then I'm going to write the 2 sine x cosine x. Notice I've not really changed my equation. I've just sort of rewritten it. But I've done that because here is what I need to replace with sine 2x. So I'm going to do that next. I have 3 times the cosine of 2x equals 4 times the sine of 2x. Now, what I've accomplished at this point is getting the same argument, 2x. What I need to do now is figure out if there's a way that I can get this into a single trig function instead of having both a sine and a cosine. And again, there perhaps would be several things that you might do. One possibility would be to square both sides because I know that sine squareds or cosine squareds can be converted into the other trig function. However, sometimes I like to avoid that if possible because recall if you square both sides of an equation, you sometimes introduce extraneous or extra solutions and you have to be careful and do a check. What I'm going to prefer to do at this point is I recall that the tangent is sine divided by cosine. So what I'm going to do is divide first of all by the cosine of 2x on both sides because that will give me a tangent over here, but then I'm also going to divide by that 4 so that these cosine 2x's cancel. I have 3 fourths over here. On this side my fourths cancel and sine 2x over cosine 2x is tangent 2x. So that has allowed me to get down to a single trig function. Now there's only one word of caution here. Is this legal to do? Well, I can always divide both sides of an equation by the same thing as long as I'm not dividing by zero. So I'm going to make a note right here that the cosine of 2x cannot be zero because otherwise I have done an invalid division here. Now, I'm not worried about the 4. I know it's not zero. So once we get our final solutions, I'm just going to do a quick check and make sure those x values don't make this cosine equal to zero. Okay? Now, I have a tangent function, it has a positive value, so we are in quadrants what? 1 and 3, aren't we? 3 fourths is not one of our special angles, is it? Doesn't, one of our special angles does not have a tangent value of 3 fourths. So we will be doing a calculator solution here, quadrant 1 and quadrant 3. Alright, so let's do our inverse tangent on our calculator. And, of course, 3 fourths is the same thing as 0.75 if you want to just enter it that way. And so for 2x, my calculator is giving me, first of all, 36. And I'm going to write this as 8699. I know this says nearest tenth, but again, we've got to do some division here, and I'll round off later. There's my first quadrant value. Okay, now I need to get over here in the third quadrant. So this first quadrant value will be the reference here. So I need to add 180 degrees to this answer to get my second quadrant. Or my, sorry, my third quadrant, 216.8699. Okay, so there's my quadrant 1 and quadrant 3. Now, we may want to do the same thing here that we did a moment ago. Uh, while I've got these numbers here, I might just go ahead and divide because we know to get down to um, 
the final answer we're going to need to divide by 2 since I have 2x here. So this 216.8699 if we divide by 2 is 108 and now I'll round off to the nearest tenth, 0.4 degrees. And let's go back to the 36.8699 divided by 2 gives me a solution of 18.4 degrees. Okay? Now, we're finding what 2x? If x is between 0 and 360 degrees, then where's 2x? That's right, it goes up to 720, doesn't it? So we need, need to make a second revolution. Again, one revolution is 360 degrees. So if we add 360 degrees to our 36.8699, that gives me 396.8699, and I'm going to divide by 2 to go ahead and get my final answer down here. That's 198.4 degrees. Okay, and then finally, this third quadrant answer, we need to do a revolution on that one. So 360 plus 216.8699 is 576.8699. And again, we will divide that answer by 2. Uh, I have 288.4 degrees. And again, a quick double check. Notice x values are staying between 0 and 360, aren't they? Okay, now quick check. Notice I said the cosine of 2x could not be 0. Well, look at what 2x turned out to be, these numbers here. Well, where is the cosine equal to 0? It's at 90 degrees. Well, none of my answers are 90 degrees. Where else? At 270. Do I have any 270s here? No, I don't. So my answers are fine, aren't they? None of those are going to make that cosine be 0. You may be finding as we go along here that some of the things you learned in the previous lesson on solving trig equations applies here, in that you may sometimes have to use identities to simplify your equation to some point, and of course you're relying to your early trig where you're finding reference angles and determining how many revolutions, and then also some things coming up just from algebra in terms of we can't divide by zero, so we need to be sure that our answers are all okay. Let's go back to the examples. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 360 degrees. When appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest tenth of a degree. Okay, well we have cosine x equals sine squared x over 2. Again, notice the arguments are different. Well, let's see. I think to save a little bit of space here, let me use another sheet of paper. And let's think identities. And the one I'm thinking about is the half-angle identity. The sine of x over 2 is plus or minus the square root 1 minus cosine x divided by 2. You may recall that identity. Notice we have sine squared. What happens if we square both sides of this? Well, if we square both sides, of course, we get the sine squared x over 2 on this side. If you square a positive, you get a positive. If you square a negative, you get a positive. So those signs don't matter anymore. And if you square something under a square root, then it just removes the square root, doesn't it? So we have sine squared x over 2 is 1 minus cosine x all divided by 2. And notice we have the same argument. So I'm going to use this identity here and rewrite my equation. The cosine of x is 1 minus the cosine of x all divided by 2, just using the identity and replacing sine squared x over 2 with that part. Now remember, identities are always true, so I don't have to be concerned about this not working in the equation. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 so that we can clear out our fraction on this right-hand side. So 2 cosine x equals 1 minus cosine x. Now we're going to add this cosine x over here, so I have 3 cosine x equals 1. And finally, we will divide by 3, and we will have solved for our cosine function. Now we have a cosine function, its value is positive. The cosine is positive in quadrant 1 and 4, isn't it? So we want our solutions in quadrants 1 and 4. 
One third is not one of our special values. So we'll be using our inverse cosine here to solve for x. And you need that decimal form for your one third. So you may on your calculator, if you put in your inverse cosine first, you might need to use a parenthesis and just say one divided by three and that will keep you lots of decimal places there. And then when you execute that, uh, and since we're finding x, we're going to go ahead and round this off to the nearest tenth, 70.5 degrees. Now, that is my quadrant 1 value. Now we need to go around to quadrant 4, okay? So that 70.5 is going to be a reference in quadrant 4. So 360 degrees minus the 70.5 gives me 289.5. Now, the nice thing about this one is notice that we're finding x. x is between 0 and 360 degrees, so we just need to make the one revolution. We only have these two solutions. So isn't that lovely that we just had uh, so little work once we recognize the appropriate identity here, okay? Solve for x in the interval 0 to 360 degrees. When appropriate, give a calculator solution to the nearest tenth of a degree. Now, again, you'll notice we've got different arguments, 2x on this side and 1x on this side. So, again, we might want to consider some identities. Um, and since this side is sine 2x, you know, you might think about sine 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. And the only problem that I see with replacing that one is that on this side, I've got cosine squared. There's not going to be any way that I can separate the sines from the cosines, and I'll have a mixture of trig functions. So I think instead of that identity, I'm going to consider another possibility. Let's think about some identities for cosine 2x. One of them is cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And there's a cosine squared x, but notice if I solve for that, I'll have, again, a mixture of sines and cosines. But remember, there's also other forms of this identity. Uh, if you replace sine squared here with 1 minus cosine squared and distribute that negative and simplify, you get 2 cosine squared x minus 1. Look at that 2 cosine squared x. That's what we have up here in the equation. So if I just add this 1 on the other side, cosine 2x plus 1 is the same thing as 2 times the cosine squared of x. And notice then, I've still got a mixture, but at least I've accomplished getting down to the same argument. Okay. Now I think at this point I'm going to approach it from this standpoint and see if I can do the solution sine 2x in place of 2 cosine squared, I'm going to use cosine 2x plus 1, okay? Now, I think I'm going to go ahead and square both sides at this point, and I think I'll uh, make a note, since I'm squaring both sides, that I have to check, because I may get some extraneous answers here. All right, I have sine squared 2x equals cosine squared 2x. Now don't forget this is a binomial, so you square the first term, first term times second term, and then remember you double that, so I'll have 2 cosine 2x, and then you square that last term and get a plus 1, okay? The reason I wanted to square both sides is because sine squared 2x is 1 minus cosine squared 2x. So if we make that substitution, Notice now I have everything in terms of cosine 2x, and something else nice happens. If we subtract 1 from both sides of this equation, that's going to drop out. If we add this cosine squared to the 1 over here, we get a 0 is 2 times cosine squared 2x plus 2 times the cosine of 2x. Now, I wanted to get to that zero if I could, because remember, if you have a zero and you can factor, you can solve by setting each factor equal to zero, and I can certainly factor now. I can factor out a 2 cosine 2x, which leaves us cosine 2x plus 1. Now that I've been able to factor, 
we're going to set each of these factors equal to zero. And again, we're going to solve for the trig function. So dividing by 2 here, I have cosine 2x equals 0. Oops, I forgot my equals 0. And solving here, I'll subtract the 1. Cosine 2x is negative 1. Okay? Now, what kind of answers? We want degree solutions. And I believe with these numbers, we can give exact values, can't we? Um, let's think about basic solutions. So we're finding 2x here. We said the cosine is 0 where? The cosine is 0 at 90 degrees and it's also 0 at 270 degrees, isn't it? Okay, and that'd be in our one revolution. Where is the cosine equal to negative 1? That's at 180, isn't it? Okay, so our basic solutions are going to be 90 degrees, 270 degrees, and 180 degrees. Now again, recall we're doing 2x. x is between 0 and 360, so where's 2x? It's between 0 and 720. That means we need to do a second revolution, doesn't it? Okay, so if I add 360 degrees to the 90 degrees, that's 450 bring those down here. If I add 360 to the 270, that's 630. And finally, if I add 360 to the 180, that's 540. Okay, and then again, to get our x, we need to do what? Divide by 2. So I have 45 degrees. 270 divided by 2 is 135 degrees. 180 divided by 2 is 90 degrees. 450 divided by 2 is 225 degrees. 630 divided by 2 is uh, going to be 315. And 540 divided by 2 is going to be 270 degrees. Okay? Now, don't quit. Remember my note. Why is it that I have to check? Because I squared both sides and I may have some extra answers here. Now, there's one thing I'm going to point out here that will help me in checking. Notice on the right hand side, after you do the cosine of your value, you're going to do what? You're going to square it. That means if the cosine value is positive, or negative, it doesn't really matter. When you square it, you're going to get a positive answer, aren't you? So this side will always be positive because you're going to have a positive value times 2. So very quickly we might look over here and any of these solutions that would make this function on this side negative we know can't be right. Okay? So it'll be easy to check. Notice we're finding x but we're putting 2x here. Well if x is 45 2x is 90. Is the sine of 90 negative? No, it isn't. If x is 135, we get 270. Is the sine of 270 negative? Yes, it is. So I know this 135 can't be right. Okay, 90, if we double that, that's 180. Is the sine of 180 negative? No, it isn't. It's actually 0. But notice, if we put 90 degrees here, the cosine of 90 is 0, so that one's going to check. Okay, if x is 225, if we double that, that's 450, but that's still going to, if you do the revolution, going to be in the first quadrant. And I'll tell you another thing, if the basic angle checked, after you do a revolution, it's in the same quadrant, so it should also be okay. The 630 was one revolution after 270. That gave us the 135. So that means it does not check because, again, it's going to end up over there in a different quadrant. And then finally the 270, if we double that's 540, okay, but we're going to get a zero there and that's going to check also. So the main thing we needed to catch was that these two solutions here we have to X out because they're going to give us a negative on one side and a positive on the other. Now you could do the actual numerical check also to be even more sure. Solve for x in the interval 0 to 2 pi. And this doesn't say, but I'm assuming since all of these others have 
said for us to round off that we, since we're working in radians, we'll go ahead and round off to hundreds like we were doing earlier if we have to use a calculator value. Okay, well notice I've got the two trig functions. They're a product, they're like factors, but they're not equal zero. So I'm going to need to rewrite this somehow. And again, that sine x cosine x always reminds me of that double angle identity. So I'm going to just simply take this equation and multiply both sides by 2. The 2 sine x cosine x then can be replaced with just sine 2x. And 2 times 0.035 is going to be 0.07, okay? So using that identity, I've gotten down to a single trig function, and this will be more easily solved. It's a sine function that has a positive value. So we know we are in quadrants 1 and 2 when we get these values. Now the 0.07 is obviously not going to give us a special angle, so we need to do the inverse sine of 0.07. Again, be sure you've changed your calculator to radians because that's what we're working with here. And so I have um, for 2x 0.0701. Again, I'm going to keep some extra decimals here uh, since we're dividing by 2, but I think I will save a little bit of time and go ahead and divide that one by 2 while I have it in my calculator. And to the nearest hundredth, that's a 0.04. Okay? Now, that's my quadrant 1 solution. So I need, over here in quadrant 2, this 0.0701 is a reference. So I need pi subtract that, don't I? But since we're working with this decimal form, let's get the decimal form of pi, 3.1416, and subtract the 0.0701. That's going to give me a 3.0715, okay? That's my second quadrant answer. Now we divide by 2 here, and my second value is 1.54 if I round off to hundreds. Now again, we're doing 2x. x is between 0 and 2 pi. Since we're doing 2x down here, 2x has to run between 0 and 4 pi, so we need another revolution, don't we? Now since we're working in the radians, Remember, one revolution is 2 pi, so 2 times pi, recall, was 6.2832. So if I add 6.2832 to the 0 0.0701 to get a revolution there, I have 6.3533. And I will divide that by 2. And down here I have 3.18. Okay? So I've done the basic one and a revolution of it. Now I need to do a revolution on this second one here. So 6.2832 will be added to 3.0715. That gives me 9.3547. And again, divide by 2 and 4.68 is what I'm getting as a round off solution there, okay? This completes our lesson on solving trig equations with multiple angles. You'll find that sometimes these equations aren't necessarily a lot of fun to solve because they do get rather long. But remember again, watch for do you want degrees or radians? Can you give an exact value or just a calculator solution? And finally, make sure that you're finding all of the solutions that are required. So you have to pay attention to that argument of that trig function and see if you need to do more revolutions to go on around rather than just getting the basic solutions.